My name is Peggy LaPointe, and this is Talking Trash, a Green Tips podcast. A chance for me to dive into the world of environmental issues by talking to people in business, government, and nonprofits, folks knee deep in the field of sustainability. Episode 63 features Sherry Vilmark, Program Director at Community Energy Project. I had heard of, and I actually uh, talked about Community Energy Project years ago on various green tips. And then I looked and saw that uh, you guys are turning 40 this year. Is that correct? Oh, we just turned 40 this last year, actually. We had our 40-year party, (laughs) Um, yeah, uh, this uh, last fall, really. Uh, Well, congratulations. Why, thank you. We look look like we're only 29. (laughs) Don't we all? (laughs) Um, if you could, uh, could you describe to folks who Community Ed- Energy Project is and what you do in the community? Yeah, so we are a small but growing nonprofit that, as you mentioned, has been in Portland for 40 years, and we provide a variety of services. Um, I oversee the education department, so we provide workshops on do-it-yourself weatherization, Simple things like putting plastic in windows all the way up to how to insulate your own attic. We teach workshops on lead poisoning prevention as well, how to live in older homes and avoid lead exposure, and how to do a project in a safe way that disturbs lead paint without exposing yourself. And we loan out HEPA vacuum cleaners as part of that program as well. And now we are starting to do some education around uh, community solar, which is a new program that CEP is the low-income facilitator for. Oh, that's great. We also, yeah, we also have a direct service side uh, with a focus on low-income seniors and people with disabilities. We go out and weatherize homes and make safety-related repairs and larger repairs like roof and electrical, and we can do things like replace water heaters or install thermostats. Gotcha. And this is really important because any steps that you can take Uh, whether it be something simple, like you said, as just putting plastic on your windows, which we've done uh, in the Mm -hmm. winter because we have an old home, to adding insulation is huge. It can really add up as far as savings. And the the initial cost doesn't necessarily have to be big in order to have big payoffs down the line. Right. And for our workshops and our services, we not only provide the technical advice, but for people who are income qualified, they also receive free supplies, so they don't have to purchase them either. Right. And let's di- let's dive in first to the workshops, because uh, that's one of the first things that you mentioned. These are throughout Multnomah County. They're free to the public. And as you said, uh, qualified participants can get free supplies, which makes it uh, much easier for them. Now, granted, these are not normal times. And, uh, you know, workshops, things like that are not happening. But... Right. You know, fingers crossed, uh, we will be back into normal times uh, in due time, (laughs) at the right time. Uh, And so what do these workshops look like? You mentioned, uh, I think you mentioned all five of them, right? There are five? I think so, yes. We have have two kinds of weatherization. Uh, Well, we have an insulation one, but we also have a basic cooling workshop that's brand new. So it's how to stay cool in the summer without air conditioning. So the one that focuses on like plastic in the windows and staying warm all winter is wrapped up for the season. And this summer, hopefully, when things uh, are back to normal and uh, these restrictions are lifted, uh, we'll be providing workshops on how to stay cool. And that's focused on things like controlling light, what enters your home, and uh, air control. And in that program, we provide box fans for people so that they can move hot air out of their home and cool air into their home. And we, it's a two hour class that, um, that goes into it. And a lot of folks we found actually saved money from that program as well because they were able to um, stop using or lessen the use of air conditioning. We'll talk about that a little bit because we don't have uh, central air. We have one uh, window unit upstairs, and we do a lot of moving around box fans during the day. So describe a little <laughs> bit, <laughs> but it works. You know, it, sure. it really yeah. does. So describe to people what that looks like, sort of what the workshop would look like and what, um, what folks are teaching participants. Sure. I'd say one of the biggest things is to control your light. 
So if you have windows, especially south and east and west facing windows, and you're having light that's actually entering your home, that's going to produce a lot of heat when it comes in contact with objects in your home. So we talk a lot about blinds, curtains, and the best option is exterior shades, if possible. And that's going to um, control that light piece. And then when it comes to how to use fans appropriately, the best thing to do is to have two thermometers. One is outside, so you know what your outside temperature is, and one is on the inside. Basically, when it is cooler outside than it is inside, have all your windows open and all your fans going. Um, any hot rooms, like if you had a side room that was really hot, you would want to have the air vent out. So you would have the air flow outside, and it would vent the heat out. Uh, otherwise, intake is really nice and it feels really good. Once that temperature is the same, you shut everything off and you shut everything down. And a lot of people, um, I ride my bike around the city and I have I go by a lot of homes where people have fans running at 6 o'clock at night, the hottest part of the day in August, and they've got fans in their windows. And that's one of the worst things you can do. So you shut everything down, you close all those blinds, and then you wait until the temperature is colder outside than inside. And it's hard to tell, you, you want to use thermometers because it's really hard to tell when you're just feeling it, when you're walking from one to the other. And I would say I've used these methods for some years and I can have a 20 degree difference. It can be 100 degrees outside and it's 80 in my house. And 80 is warm, but it feels really good after <laughs> coming in from triple digits. But you're right. Uh, we do exactly what you're talking about. In the morning, we've got the fans going. We've got them pointed inside so that it's drawing the cold air or the cooler air in. And it's usually around 10 o'clock that we start shutting everything down, close the blinds where the sun is uh, is coming in. And um, if we don't have, you know, seven to ten days in a row of extreme heat mm -hmm. our house stays pretty good um uh, we've we've managed so far anyway and your upstairs situation that would be the perfect one where you would actually at the tipping point of the day like in the evening you would want to vent the heat out of your house yep. and what it'll do is it'll draw air in from the cooler part of your house to cool off your upstairs exactly and we talk to folks in the workshop, we go into details about, well, what are the hottest part of your house or your home or your apartment, and how do you deal with it? And then we talk about sun, uh, which directions the sun are coming up and down, and we talk about trees and different shade spots as well, and how to adapt all that to stay cool. We also talk about things that produce heat, cooking, for example. Even something as simple as putting a lid on your pot can reduce the amount of heat needed to, say, boil water or to cook food. <clears throat> so you can turn down your element and produce that much less heat. Yeah. LED light bulbs. Uh, we talk about vampire power and what appliances are pumping heat out. And we even talk about how to uh, reduce that sort of thing. Yeah, those are all great tips. And um, I got a toaster oven, which I love because in the summer, uh, if I do have to heat something in the oven, at least it's really limited and um, and it's not giving off as much heat, which seems to yeah. help. Uh, it's, oh, I, I use the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know that the winter workshops, the basic weatherization and insulation are done for the season, uh, but, uh, I, and, and folks aren't putting plastic on their windows, but what other DIY, so if, you know, if folks are home, as we are at home, uh, and maybe even thinking about, you know, projects that could help next winter and, and lower energy costs, what are some of the things that you cover in there? Just again, it gives somebody, it gives somebody something to think about that they can do for next winter. Yeah, there's a lot of great stuff that actually overlaps with cooling as well. Uh, the biggest, one of the biggest things is draft stopping. So as human beings, we're sensitive to several things that make us comfortable or uncomfortable. We're sensitive to air temperature, humidity, and air movement, and the objects, the temperature of objects around us. Like if a wall is really cold, like if you've ever gone away for like a week in the winter and decided, I'm shutting off all my heat, I'm going to save some money that week, and then you come back and it feels like it takes like three days for your place to get warm again. 
That's because all the heat has been lost from all the objects in your house, your walls, your floors, your counters, your cabinets, your bookshelves, like all that stuff. And then as you're heating up the space again, it takes a long time for those to absorb enough heat for you to be comfortable again. So you can use that reverse for cooling, right? Get your place really, really, really cold, uh, like uncomfortably cold, <laughs> leading up to a heat wave and use your objects as a heat sink. And you can also take that opposite approach um, in the winter by, say, moving furniture. If, you're, if you like to sit on the couch and watch TV, maybe put the TV next to the window and you next to an interior wall so that you're not sitting in the coldest part of the house, which would probably be the window. Right. And when you're installing like plastic on windows, what you're doing is on one hand, it can be stopping a draft um, to keep air from moving. But ideally, what you want is an insulating barrier of non-moving air, right? Like a down jacket. It's not the feathers that keep you warm. It's that pocket mm -hmm. of air that's not moving that keeps you warm. So anything you can do, um, people have used a lot of things other than plastic. Um, you can use blankets, although you won't be able to see through them. Some people have given tips that even bubble wrap. They've been able to spritz water on there and kind of have suction to hold bubble wrap up on the windows because it's just pockets of dead air. It's the same concept. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about draft stopping, we're also looking at, you know, drafts coming in around the doors. Drafts coming in even through your outlet. Yeah. If you have a fireplace, 14% of air loss in a room with a fireplace comes from that fireplace. That's crazy. And so putting a chimney plug up in there um, can really stop. Even if you have a damper in place, it can make a really big difference. And that's going to keep cool air in your home in the summer as well. So all those draft stopping and insulating, it's like, it's like a thermos can keep your drink hot or cold. Same with your house. <laughs> Insulation keeps your place cool or warm. And we talk a lot about behaviors as well. Um, we don't really uh, talk about necessarily flipping off lights when you leave the room, but it's just a natural side effect of what people say they do when they're more aware of energy uh, consumption. We talk about what's something called vampire load. Mm -hmm. That's when objects are on standby mode and they're still using a lot of energy. You can turn them off at uh, a power switch at the bottom, like a power strip, I mean, at the bottom of a whole pile of electronics. You just turn it off at the when you go to bed or when you leave for the day or unplug things as well. Yeah. So from big stuff to the little bitty stuff. Exactly. Uh, yeah, Cameron Starr from Energy Trust of Oregon talked about uh, phantom loads as well, which, uh, you know, is one of those things that's really easy to forget. Uh, what about lead poisoning prevention and lead safety home projects? I mean, this is, uh, mm. this is year-round kind of things. What do you discuss with folks on how to prevent lead poisoning? Yeah, so there's, if you live in an older home with lead, so uh, lead paint was banned for residential use in 1978. So if you're in a home older than that, and a lot of homes um, in Portland can be from the 20s, you're very likely to have lead in the paint. So one of the biggest things to be aware of are friction points. Now, if lead paint is on your wall and it's covered in four layers of latex point paint, it's not really hurting anything, right? It's, it's encapsulated. But if you have old wooden double hung windows and you're opening and closing them and opening and closing them and you have mm. doors that have layers of lead paint or steps and you've just got these friction points that generate the lead dust. And lead is a neurotoxin um, that's especially detrimental to children six and under um, or pregnant women. It's uh, very dangerous for the fetus. So we want to, and it does not take very much, they say, the size of a grain of sand, a piece of lead the size of a grain of sand is enough to cause what's called an elevated blood lead level. So what we focus on is uh, really great cleaning. So this is what we've gotten into with all this COVID-19 is to <laughs> talk about the importance of soap. Right. And soap um, breaks down the lipids of a virus, which is great, but it also bonds to a lot of other things, including lead. So when we talk about you have a double hung window, that is opening and closing, and it may have lead dust on the windowsill, you want to take a soapy water and, and something that you can throw away, probably like, um, like a heavy-duty paper towel, and you want to wipe that down and, you know, just scrub it with, like, 
soap and water. So it bonds at that level, at that molecular level, Mm -hmm. and you get it out. Um, You get it away. With Lead Safe Home Projects, what we're looking at is most lead poisoning prevention cases occur because of remodeling that is not done in a lead safe way. So if you want those old windows and you want to replace them with energy efficient windows, it's a really good idea to know what lead safe work practices look like. There's a lot around containment. How do we keep that dust from re- in that window replacement uh, project, which generates a lot of lead dust if you have old housing, how do you keep all that lead contained? There's a lot about draping plastic. Workers should be in personal protective gear. There should be tape up that doesn't allow anybody in that space. Nobody should be eating or drinking in that space. And children, they live in the home, should not be there during the project or allowed anywhere near that space. So that's a class that really talks about all the ways working wet so that dust is contained, how to even bag up debris in a way that Mm -hmm. you twist the neck and you make what's called a gooseneck so that nothing bursts out when you shove it in your trash can. You don't just get a face full of lead dust, um, that sort of thing. Yeah, even spray it down. Yeah, it's very preventable issue. Like, I mean, it's a scary topic, but it's very very preventable if you're aware of it. Yeah. Now, the uh, in-home series that you touched upon, those are for qualified seniors uh, and people with disabilities in the Portland area. And um, you have the weatherization with with, with that series and then safety repairs. So talk a little bit about those options for the in-home series that Community Energy Project does. Yeah. Well, we do have our focus is on seniors, which we just define as 55 and older, um, and people with disabilities. So they don't have to be on disability. A person can just say, I'm physically not able to do this myself. And there are priorities, um, but we can also serve uh, people who who don't um, have a disability or are seniors. We just focus on them. So weatherization can be a lot of the same things we teach in the workshop. We install draft stopping supplies. We work with 100 to 200 volunteers a year who come out and install them on these big weatherization days. You know, we can do 15 windows at once, that sort of thing. We can make other energy upgrades. I mentioned water heaters. So we've been upgrading to heat pump water heaters. And a heat pump water heater is much, much more efficient than a standard electric water heater because a heat pump water heater doesn't have to make all that heat itself. It's actually pulling heat from the environment around it. That's how a heat pump works and why they're so efficient. <clears throat> so we install <coughs> excuse me. So we install heat pump water heaters for folks, uh, which will hopefully bring down their energy bill and make their uh, water heating a lot more efficient. We install nest thermostats. Mm-hmm. Thermostats are one of the biggest things you could do, right? Like you mentioned earlier, remembering how to do all these things to save energy. It's really easy to forget. Well, thermostats are great because, you know, they automatically turn off the heat at night when you go to bed or on a little bit before you get up in the morning or if you leave for the day. So we install those for free as well. That's awesome. Uh, the Something that, and I'm guessing this is new because Home Energy Score here in Portland is fairly new, two years now I think it is. Uh, you, you offer home energy scores. Uh, well, you you send folks to uh, homes for home energy scores. And tell me a little bit about this program. So a home energy score is, as you mentioned, required by the city of Portland so that somebody buying a home has a really strong understanding of the energy burden of that home. So you can come into a home and it can have brand new windows. And a lot of people can assume that oh, new windows, they must have made a lot of energy efficiency upgrades. But that might not be the case. There might be no insulation in the attic or in the walls. You could have an ancient water heater or electric furnace that's 30 years old. And so an energy score just helps people understand, oh, here's the average energy bill that I can expect um, for the year. And uh, here is the score on a scale of, I don't remember if it's 1 to 10 or 0 to 10, um, but it tells you how efficient your home can be, or it is based on how efficient it could be. Mm-hmm. And then there's advice on what are the 
What's the low-hanging fruit you can do to bring up that score? So we provide those uh, for a fee to general market customers, and for low-income customers, we provide that score for free. Yeah, and this is a great score to have because if you're buying a house, you know, it's like buying a car. You know how many miles per gallon it gets and how uh, efficient it is that way. Same with a house, to have that number and know what the efficiency is uh, before you buy a house and maybe what projects you want to tackle first to raise that score for yourself so that your energy costs are lower. Exactly. So the score is required when you're selling a home, but you can get it at any point. I mean, I can tell just personally, um, I bought my first home at the same time my younger brother bought his first home within just a few months of each other. And I had this really great realtor who was connecting me with a really great inspector. And me being from the energy world, I asked a lot of questions about the energy burden that I was likely to face when I bought my home. My brother did not have a great realtor or an inspector. And so he moved into his home with his brand new baby mm. and learned that they had all just no central heating. It was all cadet wall heaters. And the first electric bill he had was over $400, Holy cow. which really floored him. And, he's, and the house wasn't that warm. But he didn't want to make the house colder because he had a newborn in the house. Mm -hmm. And so a home energy score would have alleviated that sticker shock. He would have known what to expect and that that was going to either be kind of a built-in expense monthly to live there or that he would have to invest a significant sum of money to make upgrades to the home to change that situation. Yeah, we we had one on our home because I interviewed somebody uh, about it when the when the ordinance came about. And I live in a 1920s home, um, and I and we have old windows. And I thought, oh my gosh, our score is not going to be very high. Um, but it turned out to be high because years ago we had added a lot of insulation to the attic and to the walls. Uh, and the inspector uh, essentially said, this insulation is a big reason why your number is lower. Um, uh -huh. So that was uh, that made me really glad that we decided to add all of that insulation, um, and uh, and it does give you pointers as to what else you can do to raise the score as well. Um, as a general, yeah, as a general rule, if you pick one thing, you're in an old house, insulate your attic first. Yep. Just yep. as a general rule, that is your number one thing. And it will be cheaper probably than the windows. <laughs> yeah, to replace, but. absolutely. And that's probably and that is one reason why we chose insulation because it was less expensive upgrade to make for our for our home than to add all of the windows uh, to our home. Um, you mentioned something towards the beginning about uh, solar panels. So can you talk a little bit about about that and community energy project? Yeah. So there's actually a brand new program in Oregon um, that's allowed for customers of PGE, Pacific Power, and Idaho Power called Community Solar. And how Community Solar works is it's essentially off-site solar. So say uh, you have a home that, and you wish you could have solar panels, but your roof is really old or you have really old electrical or you have these big gorgeous trees you do not want to cut down, or you rent or you live in a mobile home. There's a million reasons why people don't have solar panels. So Community Solar allows you to sign up for a project, a really big solar project most likely, and you would kind of have like a share of it, and then you would get credits really similar to the kind of credits you would get if you had panels on your home. And it's, it's a little bit... Um, and it should be cheaper, kind of for the same reason, like if you went in with a bunch of friends at like Costco to buy like 40 pounds of beans, <laughs> and then you split up a pound among all of you, it would be a lot cheaper than if you went and bought a pound of beans. Mm -hmm. So wow. using that same kind of model, Community Solar tries to make large projects, and then everybody gets a section of it and can take advantage of what's called the economy of scale. So CEP, our role is as the low-income facilitator. The law that passed, which was Senate Bill 1547, or the Coal to Clean Bill, it passed a few years ago, said that 10% of all of the energy produced by community solar needs to be made available to low-income participants. So our role is to recruit, educate, and inform low-income participants and people who have been left out of solar movements thus far because of 
you know, physical things like not owning your home or financial issues like, you know, having to have a really stringent credit check or upfront fees. And, you know, you have to have a lot of um, access to money or a lot of solar panels, you rely on tax credits. So you have to have a high enough income to receive tax credits to get solar panels. And all of this doesn't really apply in a community solar situation. So we're going to be recruiting several thousand people to be a part of community solar. Nice. And how can people get involved in that? Well, it's super brand new. <laughs> <laughs> so there is, a, or it's um, Oregon CSP org is the community solar website and there's a newsletter there the best way to do it is to sign up for the newsletter and they'll basically let everybody know when projects become available to sign up for low-income participants if you think you might meet our income guidelines you can go to our website or the Oregon solar website and go to the low-income section and take a look and you can actually make appointment with, with us now and get on the wait list and then we would assign you to projects as they come up. That's great. Uh, and I'll make sure that I put Oregon, uh, or rather Community Solar, uh, on this page uh, for this conversation so people can uh, find it pretty easy. And then um, one other, th- well, not maybe, maybe not one other thing. I don't want to end this conversation too soon. But I did notice something else on the website, Free Home Consult with Home Efficiency Advisor. Um Tell us, because this is timely, we're not going out, we're not meeting face-to-face, is this, is this something that folks could take advantage of now if they're thinking about uh, projects that they might want to tackle? Yes, actually, we have forwarding set up on our office phone so they can still call the same numbers and it's going to get forwarded to that home energy consult. His name is Peter. And uh, what he'll do is basically do a walkthrough with your home and then give you advice on what you would want to do next to make your home more energy efficient. And we can also connect people with loans or contractors and make recommendations on who to work with if you wouldn't qualify for our free program. Gotcha. If you qualified for our free programs, you just connect you with those. Now, let me ask you one other thing uh, before we go. So um, let's just say this is a normal year. Okay, Uh, and your summer uh, workshops were going to be happening. What time of year do those summer workshops happen? Well, we have we have lead poisoning prevention workshops year round. So Mm -hmm. those go through the summer, Um, both the lead safe home projects one and that basic lead 101 class. And then the cooling workshops will happen really frequently. Basically, it would start in probably early June. We would start setting them up as the weather started to get warm and people started to get concerned about it. Mm -hmm. And we're going to serve about, hopefully still, serve 200 households through that cooling workshop program. And those would go through August, maybe a little bit into September, and then right around the turn of uh, summer to fall, we start up on the keeping warm weatherization workshops again. So that usually starts in um, early October as things start to get cool and people start to think about that. Perfect. And if anyone has any questions, I'll have uh, your link on our website. And you folks uh, are available over the phone to talk to folks about any of this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Sherry, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. Be safe uh, and uh, have a um, fantastic week. Thank you. You too. Thank you for joining me for my conversation with Sherry Vilmark, Program Director at Community Energy Project. If you've missed any of the previous podcasts, you can find them at our website at kink.fm. Be sure to like and subscribe to Talking Trash, a Green Tips podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you're listening. Talking Trash is a podcast series featuring people in business, government, and nonprofits and sometimes just regular folks in the Portland area and around Oregon who are having an impact in the world of sustainability. 